Hello, and welcome to Thomas McGuire and Rosemary McGuire, father and daughter Alaska authors discuss a lifetime of shared stories. I am Trish Jenkins. I'm the coordinator for Alaska Book Week. I'm also on the board of Alaska Center for the Book. Every year during the first week in October, Alaska Center for the Book coordinates Alaska Book Week. If you want more information about Alaska Book Week, please visit our website at alaskabookweek.org. There you will find many recorded Zoom events and announcements about in-person events that take place sometime between October 5th and October 12th. Before we start our conversation with Rosemary and Tom, I want to introduce our featured authors. Tom came to Alaska in 1969 with two college friends. The mountains and the rivers and the roadless wilderness fascinated him, and 55 years later, he's still not ready to leave. He has worked as a salmon fisherman, carpenter, and North Slope oil feed worker. Alongside his wife, Sally, he raised four children in a house they built on the bank of the Chilkoot River. Grizzly bears are frequent visitors. Tom has also paddled thousands of miles down and up Northern rivers. His first book was about a trip down the Yukon River with the legendary canoeist, Charlie Wolf. His second, Stellar's Orchard, was a novel set in the I'm gonna say this wrong, Shumagan Islands in 1924. The Curve of Equal Time is his second novel. Rosemary is a lifelong Alaskan who has for years, who I mean, who was for years a commercial fisherman. She now works in the Arctic and Antarctic as a research technician. Her collection of short stories, The Creatures at the Absolute Bottom of the Sea, was published by the University of Alaska Press in 2015. Her coming of age memoir, Rough Crossing won the River Teeth Nonfiction Book Prize in 2016 and was published in March 2017 by the University of New Mexico Press. Both books were named among the 10 best of the year by an Alaska author. Her most recent book called Latitudes, an essay collection was published by the University of Alaska Press in 2021. So welcome to your presentation. So would each of you like to read from your most recent publications? And, and before you do that, please tell us a little bit about the book and about the passage you will read. I don't know who wants to go first. Rosemary. I can go first, yeah. Um, so this book, Cold Latitudes, it's an essay collection, as Trish just said, about working in the Arctic and Antarctic. It took many years to write because I did it somewhat in collaboration with the scientists that I worked with and the local people in the communities that I worked with. Um, it was a, a really long process of writing something and then getting approval uh, and feedback from people who were in some way um, part of the story or influenced the story off the page. So the first essay that I, I'm going to read the introduction, which is quite short, um, it's about a canoe trip that dad and I took together um, across the Brooks Range quite some time ago now, uh, but it was kind of a good intro to the themes of the book. So, Conga Cut River, Easter Island. Landing in Kaktovik, dad and I saw a polar bear tearing at the bones of a whale cast up last year, looking for scraps left on the ribs. As we gathered our belongings by the landing strip, a woman stopped me. She did not tell me her name. She was so quiet, her eyes hardly met mine, but she tried to warn me. Don't camp on the barrier islands, camp on land. There are more bears on the islands. I listened, nodding. Later, I wondered if that advice saved our lives. It was late summer. Dad and I had flown into Kaktovik on the Beaufort seacoast to paddle east along the barrier islands to the mouth of the Conga Cut and line our canoe upriver, crossing the Brooks Range to the Sheenjack River drainage. But that summer, the sea ice had retreated so far the bears couldn't reach it. Those left on land were struggling to survive. It was foggy when we paddled out of Kaktovik. The strange Arctic light robbed us of perspective. At times, we could no longer tell direction. The world melted into depthless distance. We camped that night on coastal tundra. As we sat outside our tent, we saw two polar bears moving toward us along the island nearest our camp. A mother and a yearling cub searching the bare sand for food. The channel between us was narrow, but they did not notice us. The mother sank down on the sand to rest. 
Her cub splashed into the lagoon, swimming back and forth. It moved almost like a seal, its pelvis limber and wide, broad feet driving it forward. At length, it left the water to rejoin its mother. We watched as they lay down together to sleep. Look, Dad said quietly. We saw a grizzly coming from the opposite direction. Like them, it swung its head along the tide line, questing for food. As it came near, the wind carried its smell to the mother. He scrambled to her feet, facing the grizzly. It rose on its hind legs to look at her. For a moment, they stared each other down. Then the grizzly dropped to its feet with an audible woof, swung round, and went back the way it came. The mother and cub turned away, all three bears once more searching barren ground. Slowly, I set the shotgun down. I'd felt some balance change between predator and prey. Here, we were all the vulnerable ones. The following day, we paddled outside the islands, past black bluffs softened by melting permafrost and torn by a roughening sea. It was cold. Again, the fog pressed against the water. That night, we stopped on high ground marked with a weathered cross. It bore the names of a man and two young girls who died here while traveling between Kaktovik and Aklavik. Kenneth Robert Paul, born 42963. Sandra Denise, born 61887. Sylvia Rose, born 22183. They had drowned on August 23rd, 1999, when their skiff overturned in heavy seas. One of the girls' bodies was never found. It was a lonely thing to see in a lonely place. We camped there partly for a strange kind of companionship. A ground squirrel peeked out to look at us, first from one hole, then another. At length, it decided we were not a threat and went about its business gathering seeds. Of all of us, it alone was making a home. Next morning, the surf had built. We launched through it, all but swamping, and paddled down the outer coast, outside the sheltering barrier islands, through a steel-gray monotonous sea, the land a flat line under heavy cloud. Late in the day, we saw another polar bear. We were offshore, paddling in a swell, already worrying about the wind when we saw it. It seemed to apparate out of the sea, one moment not there, the next a solid white presence assessing our canoe. There was nothing we could do except to keep paddling, nowhere to go and nowhere to hide. Does held high and easily pacing our canoe, it tracked us along the shore. I watched the grace of its gait, how effortlessly it moved over broken earth and ice. It seemed to have eight legs instead of four. At last, it turned and scrambled up a bluff of dark earth eroded by melting ice. We kept on as long as we could before we camped, knowing even so there was no way to leave its territory. We were in its place and on its terms. Mid-morning the following day, we reached the mouth of the Conca Cup. It fanned out in rivulets at the coast, choked with alfice from the winter cold. Inland, it deepened abruptly into flood, churning green through gravel banks. We rigged lines to our canoe and hauled it heavily upriver. Beast tracks and more bear sign marked the banks. Caribou and wolves, muskox and scrub willow by the river. On the third day, we reached the place where the Brooks Range rose abruptly from the coastal plain. The fog tore back. Mountains rose into blue sky over the clear, bright river, where fish hung in the pools as if suspended in the air. Our spirits rose, too, with the light. Three weeks in, we reached the mountain pass. It had frosted in the night, and the tundra was golden with fall, starred with dissolving ice, as the sun hazed the sky east of us. In the morning, we moved slowly, creakily, our bodies rejecting the cold. I lit the fire while Dad gathered firewood. He came back to tell me he'd seen a caribou near camp. It has the most beautiful antler rack I've ever seen, he said. I crunched after him over frozen grass. The caribou stood broadside to the sun near the river, unwilling to move even when it saw us. It was alone. South of us, the main herd would be passing, spilling through the porcupine drainage to winter ground. The older bulls will do that, Dad said. They'll go off by themselves, quit migrating almost before they die. This one won't last another winter. As the light struck it, I could see a faint shimmer of vapor as the cold shifted from its back. On its head rose that astonishing rack. It was a perfect thing, but so heavy it seemed to bow the animal's head. After a time, I went back to the fire. Dad stood for a long while watching until the sun burned off the wonder of the morning. I thought he looked sad, but he never said what he was thinking. 
The Sheen Jack for, flowed into the porcupine, the porcupine into the Yukon. Through the next day's falling down current, we passed through scrub willow into northern forest. Skeins of songbirds gathered, tying bright threads of flight across the sky. They linked a path through the faraway places of the world, joining them in one great highway. The nights were cold. Wet socks and boots froze overnight. Mornings, we heard the call of swans and heard their heavy wings migrating south. I saw a wild rose the last of summer, stiff with frost before dawn. In late September, we reached Fort Yukon. We pulled our canoe up the bank below the village and walked through half-deserted streets looking for the store. It was a lonely place so early in the day. Tomorrow, we would fly back to Fairbanks. Tired though we were, we felt half reluctant to go. We sat, not eating much, not talking much, eating ice cream on the steps of the village store, thinking about the river thinking about what we lost as humans when we lost our bond with this such places, lost some natural spirit. Years have passed since that journey in the Brooks Range. The caribou must be long gone. My dad is older, I am too. Cold weather, the bedrock of our world, has become a thing that cannot be depended on and development threatens the wilderness we journeyed. And yet for now, the rivers still flow north and south from a high quiet place under the Arctic sky. Long after that journey, I stopped once at Easter Island, traveling home from a job in the Southern Ocean. I was tired out for months of ice and snow and grueling work. I too tumbled from the sky as the birds do and washed up on a far off shore, wanting nothing more than to watch the water day after day and feel the, ant, feel the wind. Easter Island is a tiny lonely island, adrift in the blue waste of the Pacific. It hangs between two infinites, the unplumbable sky and the unknowable sea. Its shores are scraped bare of trees. The first people who arrived here were most likely Polynesian, a seafaring culture skilled in ways we no longer understand at navigation and reading the sea. They arrived from somewhere far to the west, flourished here for a while and passed away. It's said they may have died when they overran their resource base, cutting down the trees that made their canoes unable then to use the sea, but no one really knows. And their moas, stone statues, still remain as one of the great enigmas of the world. Their faces closed and watchful, their makers gone. At the end, with nowhere to escape to, the world ca here caved into violence, some say. As people killed people, families killed families, and rituals grew into terrible rites. I saw caves in the rock where people hid to keep other islanders from finding them. The entrances rose dizzyingly high over the sea. It must have been an act of desperation just to reach those caves each morning. It was so quiet now on that island where the trade winds still blow and the surf breaks and breaks on the outer rocks. The moas brood over the shore facing the sea. Little clear ripples roll in and vanish. The people that came from the sea do not return and may never again. And yet a feeling hangs over the island in the air, an abiding peace, a kind of deep remembering. There's a sadness to it, but a beauty too. Polynesians have a word, mana, for the spirit that breathes out of places. It was there. For days I breathed it in, a lasting grace. Leaving the river at Fort Yukon, we turn for one last look backwards in time at the river that rolled onto the sea without us. I could not then and cannot now imagine the planet without wilderness. Something irreplaceable would vanish from our time. And so this is a love, love story for a threatened world. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Tom, any comments? Well, yeah, I was along on that trip. <laughs> it was a difficult one ah. uh, to let folks know. I mean, we went up the Conga Cut, and that was 100 upriver miles with a total elevation gain of 3,000 feet. So there's a lot of work dragging a canoe yeah. up that. Oh, yeah. Kind of a funny thing to do, but that's the family hobby is going the wrong way. Um, <laughs> and then uh, we floated down the uh, Shinjek, which was very low water, late fall. And uh, that's about 200 miles down to uh, Fort Yukon. So it was a long, difficult, but immensely rewarding trip. Yeah. So, yeah, that's what I have to say. And it was a beautiful piece of writing. It was really yes. Yes, yes. So, Tom, what are you going to read from today? Well, uh, this is my most recent book, which was published in August, and it's called The Curve of Equal Time, 
and it's a novel. It's essentially about uh, salmon fishing in Southeast Alaska on the outer coast. Okay. Uh, and I did this for very many years. First year I fished was 1973. And I did it, you know, for a good 20 years, not every se summer season, but most. And uh, I was just struck by the beauty of the outer coast. It was astonishing. And that's what the book is about, but it's also about uh, human relationships. Um, a saner has uh, a skipper and four deckhands usually, that's five people. And my book is kind of compares two very different sane boats, very different skippers and very different crews. And the interrelationship, the rivalry between these two boats, but also the dynamic within uh, the individual boats where you've got five people living in very tight quarters in very hard conditions. Uh, and that uh, th there's a lot of interesting facets to those relationships, how you do it and the friendships you form and the not so friendships. You I was going to say and the not so friendships. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, uh, and the section I'm going to read now is actually from the middle of the book. And it, I just uh, want to, it highlights a couple of the characters and talks about the, the moments of beauty that you see and also some of the difficulties. So here we go. Near Cape Ulitka, Sarah Kwan was stacking web and thinking about heading south. She was tired of being cold, wet, and sleepless. It was time to be done with this fishing adventure. She pictured herself walking through Palo Alto in a summer dress, the sun shining, guys watching her. Then a wolf eel tangled in the net came over the power block. Sarah thought it was a kelp stem until it fell at her feet and writhed across the pile. She gave an inadvertent scream. Scott laughed and chucked the eel forward on the deck where it lay coiling and rippling. The energy was of fear, not malevolence, Sarah realized once her initial revulsion receded. After the set, she went forward and hung her rain jacket on the peg, turned around, and there was the eel a foot from her face, gray bulbous head, needle-like teeth, writhing tail. She shrieked again. Scott held the eel by the head, brandishing it at her with an idiotic teenage grin. <clears throat> when the adrenaline faded, Sarah thought the eel had a more intelligent expression than Scott. Just throw it overboard, Aaron said disgustedly from where he was kicking fish into the hold. Scott dropped the eel on, on the deck. The hero was fully tanked and the deck was nearly awash. The wolf eel righted itself in a little rill of seawater, trying desperately to swim. It fetched up against a gray gated scupper and lay on its side, gulping convulsively. Scott took a dat gaff hook and speared it through the head and threw it overboard, whirling to see how far he could throw it. Jesus, you didn't have to kill it, Sarah said with a jolt of nausea at the senseless violence. It's only a friggin' eel, Scott said, genuinely surprised. That night, the lily langtree lay anchored in warm chuck. Nora could see the processing barge Arctic Star, its high blocky superstructure pockmarked with lights. People were moving on the working deck that was 20 feet above the water, and Nora could hear the groan and wail of hydraulics. The lily was not scheduled to unload till morning, but Nora was too tired to sleep. She made a cup of tea and took it on the back deck. At this point of the season, a quiet moment alone was more precious than sleep. She liked the crew well enough, except sometimes Danny, but she was so hungry for female companionship that she would even welcome a chat with Sarah Kwan. With the boys, there was never an open expression of emotion, but always a barrage of irony and oblique wisecracks. As though conversation was a reverse poker game where only the losers revealed the cards they held. The lily's generator was still running, chilling the fish. Buddy appeared and lowered a thermometer in the fish hold. He grimaced at the reading. Buddy disappeared in the direction of the engine room. Nora walked over to the rail. The deck lights illuminated a patch of water, green like the edge of plate glass. The school of squid came into view, drawn to the amphitheater of light. They pulsed gracefully as they moved, 
their tentacles billowing like dancers' skirts. Then, with a sudden spurt, they vanished. At the very edge of the circle of light, a predatory shadow moved, flirting with the line of visibility. A coho, Nora thought. It faded back into obscurity, and in a few minutes, the squid entered again, stage right. They've danced in unfathomable patterns to unheard music till Buddy killed the generator and the light died. Pink bladders from gutted salmon festooned the enormous truck tires that the Arctic Star used as fenders. The lily came alongside. Once she was secured, Toby and Nick pulled the hatch covers. A young Samoan wearing hip boots and a wife beater t-shirt had come aboard from the star, and he and Danny maneuvered the fish pump suction hose into the hold. The hose could have been the trachea of a brontosaurus. Twenty feet above them, a crane controlled the hose. At its levers, a big Samoan with a bushy afro. His right arm wore a shark tattoo in the word mano. When the pump started, Nora climbed the barge ladder carrying her shower gear. Newer boats like the Viking hero had their own shower, but not the Lily Langtree. The showers were down a long corridor lined with doors, some bearing cartoons and magazine cutouts like a college dorm. Placards asked workers and visitors not to indulge in long showers, but even so, the hot water was blissful. When Nora finished, she set off in search of the cafeteria where Toby and Nick said they might go after the unloading. Confused by the maze of corridors, she headed down a ladder and came to an open workspace where Japanese technicians sorted fish eggs at manic speed. Nora looked around. She was not sure which way was forward and which was aft. A hand on her shoulder made her jump. Looking for something, Sven asked. I was trying to find the cafeteria, Nora stammered. I must have made a wrong turn. It's back aft. I'll show you. Sven took her arm and steered her away. <clears throat> I thought I was heading aft, Nora said. I get turned around on these mid-decks. Up close, Sven's bulk was intimidating. How do you like fishing with Buddy Stepovich, he asked. We've caught a few fish. It's a good boat. It's Milo's boat, Sven snorted. Milo's net, Milo's permit. Buddy's ridden those coattails all his life. Seems like we've outfished you a few times, Nora said tartly. The day Buddy Stepovich outfishes me, I'll cut my own throat. Sven held the cafeteria door for her, but then turned away. Nick and Toby and Sarah Kwan were sitting at a table. Nora had been anxious to talk with another woman, but now she wasn't sure. These old fishermen, Sarah was saying, they all look kind of mildewed, like a barrel of rotten apples. Decay, it's what the rainforest is all about, Toby said. The trees, the building, the boats, even the people, sliding into nothingness together. The curve of equal time, Sarah said. Say what? It's a famous math problem. The shape of the curve where, no matter where you start, you get to the bottom at the same time. Isn't that what a pendulum does? A little more complicated than that, a tautochrome. I was just getting ready to say, Nick said with a wink at Nora. She shook her head. Nothing on this barge made sense. On the wall behind Nick was a graph showing the barge's production of salmon cases during the Bristol Bay run. That was more like the math Nora had learned from life. Peaks and valleys and a summit you didn't know you'd reach till it was gone and you were already halfway down the back slope. And that's the end of that particular scene. Are there it's any comments? Pretty realistic description of fishing. <laughs> <laughs> Rosemary herself fished for many years, ran her own boat among her wow. other adventures. I'm in yeah. Better. Go ahead. Uh, I'm I, I really, yeah, I really enjoy that writing, especially the description of the squid. Really. <laughs> That's <laughs> the, lovely. I, that, uh, needless to say, is something I actually saw, and it was absolutely beautiful, the way the skid would move through the water. And to mm -hmm. explain this scene a little more, you, uh, all those characters are developed throughout the book. The book is done and written in third person, but at various times I view the action through um, principally Nora's voice, voice, but 
also Sarah Kwan, with whom who is much younger and with whom uh, Nora has a bit of an antagonistic feeling. And, you know, so there's a mix of uh, very experienced fishermen and people new to the trade and how they all interact. And um, yeah. Yeah. That's good. So <laughs> I want to ask you both some questions. Um, my first question is, tell us about the genre or genres you write. You know, why why the genre or these genres? Because I know, Rosemary, you do multiple genres. Um, but so so tell me about the genres you write and 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 why. Um well, I've actually already always wanted to write a novel, but dad beat me to it. Huh. So uh, that's, uh, I initially wrote fiction and I still find fiction, it sounds backwards, but I think fiction is often truer than nonfiction because you can go deeper into the heart of what you're talking about and really think about what's inside the story that you're telling. So in a lot of ways, fiction is more comfortable for me, but then after that first book of short stories, I started having a lot of life experiences that I wanted to write about. And in a lot of ways that was more difficult because like I opened with, you have to be respectful of other people's stories, other people's feelings mm -hmm. in nonfiction in a way that, you know, fiction, it's free, free game. Um, yeah. But I did have specific things that I wanted to write about. So I switched to nonfiction. Huh, that's interesting. I like that comment about fiction being more real. That's interesting to me. Yeah, that is interesting. Tom, what about you? Well, first, let me say, Rosemary, one of the things I like about your nonfiction is your use of novelistic techniques. So if you read Rosemary's book, she uses a lot of dialogue, which is actually a bit unusual in nonfiction. And she writes it very well, presumably from memory. Um, but uh, yeah, and, and I really like that. And and the, you do build suspense in your stories too, your essays. So yeah, they they you could very easily just tear and change. You sell it as a novel. Happens to Betsy. Who's to know? And for my own, um, interestingly, um, Rosemary started her first collection was fiction, and her subsequent two books have non been nonfiction. And I did the exact reverse. I. My first book was the factual account of a canoe trip I took. And since then, I've published the two novels. And I like fiction because I like story. I, I just look, like story. And I like to build characters. And I like to um, do a lot of dialogue. I like to find my characters through their voice. And uh, like Rosemary said, there's times in fiction where you can come closer to the truth than you can in fact, and vice versa. <laughs> there's one scene in, or not exactly scene in the curve of equal time. Um, <clears throat> one of my nephews wrote and asked me about the book. And there's one point where I described uh, a character's rather vulgar belt buckle. And he said, Uncle Tom, did you make that up? And I said, no possible way, <laughs> you know, could I make that up? And I said to him, you know, you don't ever have to make anything up. You just have to pay attention, which is kind of the way I wrote this book. Almost, almost everything in it actually happened. So, and anyway, that's kind of why I write fiction. And as for genre of fiction, you know, literary fiction has become... A genre in itself, I don't quite agree with that. I think you find quality writing in, you know, mysteries and probably in westerns and all kinds of things. So, um, so I'm kind of writing. I don't know what I'm writing in um, action. No, not action, not mystery quite. Although there is a mystery in this one, uh, and what I called my previous novel, I, I said I wanted to write a literate adventure story. And I guess that's what I'm aiming for. You know, I, I, I liked your comment about fiction. And I I don't know how to relate to people who tell me they don't like to read fiction. I just don't know how to relate to that. I, I, I'm like, what? <laughs> what? It's like saying you don't like to breathe. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> agreed. Absolutely agreed. No, and I and I agree with your comment about that. I, I, I enjoy fiction. And it doesn't have to be highbrow fiction either. You know, it just mm -hmm. doesn't. 
No, I love a story. It's 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 fun. Uh, I was I finished up two book series, and I was thinking, gosh, if you wrote a third series, this is probably what would have happened to the characters. So I was making my own oh. stories, you know. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Well, it's that's awesome. you know when I write, that's what I one of the things I want to do is to create <laughs> characters that the reader doesn't want to say goodbye to. That's a real goal. I, I, I want I, I want to respect my characters. They're all flawed in some way, but I want the people to think, well, where is this adventure going next? Not that I intend to write a sequel, but just I want them to yeah. Yeah. imagine a <laughs> foreground and a subsequent life of my characters. Yeah, yeah, I like that. Um, so this question is for both of you. Based on how adventurous and ambitious you both seem, I'm surprised you have time to write, to be honest. Did both of you always intend to be a writer? And and how did your writing career happen? Like who or what influenced you? Rose? I always intended to be a writer. I started writing when I was like four. Um, <laughs> yeah, that was a given from the beginning. Uh, but I did have, as you can see in dad's Zoom there, there's a lot of books in the house, so. Yeah, many books back there. Um, I yeah, couldn't there was... find a wall that didn't have books, Rose. I'm... <laughs> <Anyway>. <laughs> I know. They were just, we had a lot of books around growing up, and I had some wonderful mentors, including some here at the University of Alaska MFA program was a great experience for me. Um, Frank Seuss, in particular, was a really good teacher. And there were some people who edited each of my different books that helped me in different ways. So yeah, I, I do feel like writing can be something of a collaboration. Um, it's a community event. I'm glad to hear you say that. That's, that's an appreciation or a shout out for editors. Mm -hmm. Good you for know? you. Yeah. 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 Tom? Well, Rosemary, I remember you were writing from an early age. You did a series of small stories about Irene and you did a little newspaper and you did plays that your brothers and sister could perform in. And that was all good. And I was pretty jealous because you were writing better than I was at that time. And um, do you remember, I think I once told you you couldn't be a writer because you had a happy childhood and that all writers, oh. all writers have unhappy childhoods. It's axiomatic. So uh, anyway, oh. but you proved me wrong. Oh, no. good. I, yeah, I don't remember that. I do remember casting my little brother as a houseplant once. Yeah. That <laughs> <laughs> oh, 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 that's pipe casting. No, you know it. <laughs> so, no. Tom, what about your writing? No, her, her brother's yeah. are, are, is her yeah. sister. But yeah. um, as for myself, um, I was an obsessive reader as a child. Uh, I did not write like Rosemary did. I was a reader. And in the back, uh, my head I always what I most wanted to be was a writer but I didn't really do anything but read for years and years before I actually tried writing I never took a course in writing just sort of ultimately started writing and uh, yeah and as far as time to write one of the things I've always done seasonal blue collar work um you know, the fishing season is long and intense. I always manage to keep a journal, which I, is useful. But then you have a lot of time off. Of course, during that time, you got to chop firewood, build your house and et cetera. And the North Slope work was the same. I'd do intense periods, you know, go for a month or two where you're doing, you know, 14 hours a day, seven days a week, which is also something like fishing. So as a result, I... I had, in some sense, a lot of time off, and and I finally did start writing, and then uh, it took a long time to get published, though. Yeah, that's, that's another story. Yeah. yeah, that's yeah. I have friends who have been through the long haul. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so one thing that draws me to a book that keeps me reading or listening is a book that's more about, you know, what happened. Um, more than let me tell you about the time I, enc I encountered a bear, while be a bear while berry picking. In your books, both of you, obviously the Alaska landscape is important. So how, how does the landscape inform your writing or, or, the, or the Alaska setting, we could say? And, and what role does it play? Uh, the uh, ocean is a frequent character in both, I think, all of my books. 
And it is not there just as sort of a setting. It's playing an active role in the way that the action is shaped, like the moods of the ocean, the moods of the place, um, and the events are driven by weather a lot. So I'm not sure if that's exactly answering your question, but I feel if, if you're writing in Alaska, yeah, it is. And you're writing outdoors, which isn't necessarily a given. Um, the the place, the constraints of the place are going to drive a lot of the action, uh, but also the beauty of the place provides the redemption that a lot of the, the my characters are seeking. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, no, I, yeah, I think that answers it. Yeah, it's not just. <laughs> It happens to be in Alaska. It's an important part of what you're telling us about. Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, yeah. And for myself, I also, the oceans and rivers play a huge part in my writing. And, and I really think in both my novels, the ocean on Alaska and the outer coast is the main character. I mean, it, as Rosemary said, it absolutely shapes what happens um you know you're always dealing with well you know both, both rosemary and i commercial fished and that's like what you do that day depends on how big the waves are among other things so yeah it's 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 the major thing the thing you can't escape and that's what i like so much about living in alaska one of the reasons i've stayed is that uh, nature still has the upper hand you know it, you can't yeah. get away from it every day it, you have to make some decision about what's going to happen weather-wise, you know. And, you know, I, I noticed, I learned early on when I lived here that we like to scare newcomers with stories of living here. Uh, ooh, uh. <laughs> <laughs> and we all have stories, personal stories, as well as stories that all, almost are like lore, you know. Mm -hmm. that, oh, right. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we we just yeah, do, we I don't know if they do that in other places, but I know that they do it here. Like, don't go out on those. That you, you think you can walk out when the tide's going out? Uh, uh no, you can't. Mm -hmm. Let me tell mm -hmm. you a story. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, uh, it does. It it it's real. I think the it, although I think what with the the tremendous storms and the changes going on, the uh, people in the lower forty eight are starting to learn. You know you know, these amazing fires and torrential rainstorms and all, uh, they're suddenly being awakened to the fact that, oh my God, this is uh, a pretty incredible foe. What, uh, what the yeah, I've always thing. said when I've done little adventures, I've always said you need one MacGyver on the trip who can fix stuff. <laughs> That's for sure. Because <laughs> <laughs> something's yeah. going to break. Yeah, yeah. Well, that, that's the fish. That's the commercial fishing life. That's for sure. I mean, wow, gotta fix it. Yeah. Nobody out there to do it for you. And then you need the stuff so that those and MacGyver can do whatever they do. So yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I, I want to focus on the what happened aspect of your books. It sounds like both of you draw from some pretty interesting and intense experiences, and both good and bad. How do you know how to write about your experiences? So when a writer tells a story, whether it's nonfiction or fiction, they aren't just telling us what happened. So my real question is this, how do you how do you decide what to tell the reader with regard to what happened? And how do you know how to tell the reader what happened so that what they read is meaningful? Is that is that too much of a question? Does that make sense? So how, how it do does you know make sense? Okay. Yeah. I'm gonna get a little bit academic in my answer. Um, because, again, I had a wonderful mentor, Frank Seuss, who many people will remember, and he was a great editor. He would tell me to think about your writing, what you're writing on the page, he'd say, is kind of just the situation, like this happened, this happened, that happened, but the real story is what it all means, and as I was reading he'd sit there with a pencil, we'd look at a page together, and he'd make a little pencil mark by a paragraph and be like, can you tell me what's really going on here? Like, look deeper, what does this add to the story? Or is there a way that you can look at it and go deeper into your own experience or what this tells you about life? So I ended up, I usually write four times as much as ends up 
easily four times as much as ends up in a published book. And I discard all kinds of things that might be interesting on the surface, but that don't um, yeah. don't enhance that inner story. And that's a trick that I learned from an editor. Um, so does that? Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> No, no, it, it, it makes the point that I'm trying to make, which is you're not just telling us what happened and you have to make mm -hmm. decisions about yeah. what to keep in and what to keep out. And it needs to have some kind of significance or meaning, even if it's not yeah. obvious at the time. Yeah, it contributes to the arc or it contributes to the moral. So, yes. Yeah. Yes, yes. Tom, your thoughts? Yeah. Um, first, I want to say I really wish I'd had an uh, editor like Frank Seuss. I mean... Mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, some of those lessons that you described, I learned myself after very many failed attempts. So yeah, a little, <laughs> a little help. Mm -hmm. The editing phase would have, would have been wonderful. And uh, yeah, you do. You can't write a scene that doesn't in some way either illuminate a character or move the action on. You know, you can't waste words. And like Rosemary, um, yeah, you have to edit ferociously and it's feels good to throw out a bad scene it's tough to throw out a good scene but sometimes you have to uh, if sure. you're going to keep things moving and you really don't want to repeat yourself too much but the one thing that i found interesting as a writer of fiction um is that you know i'm creating especially in this recent book a, a cast of six or seven different characters and i have to find a way inside each one and find a voice for them, uh, a voice both, you know, in the way they think, the way they act, and the way they talk. And the way they talk is particularly critical. And the strange thing is that once you find that voice, um, all of a sudden, you, you're, Mark Twain, I think it was, it was once said that you just set up these characters and then follow them around. Because once you have their voice, sometimes they'll start writing the scene and um, the way the characters interact is like, you know, the, they say things to each other and I'd say, wait a minute, I didn't notice that, you know, <laughs> where did you come up with that? You know, so your characters, uh, that's another reason to write fiction is to see what these people you've created are up to. Does that make any sense at all? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Rosemary, did you want to make any follow-up comments or... Oh, I was actually thinking his dad talked. I could probably tell him what happened to each of his characters in the end, what they're doing now, maybe 10, 15 years later. Did you write and it down and send it to writer. me? I'd like to know. <laughs> yeah, check back. I'll, I'll let you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we might not agree, of course, and they might not agree when if, if, when they develop a voice of their own. But uh, you are you feel welcome to write a sequel to either of my mm. books. I'd mm. be happy to have you do that. <laughs> So what do, you, yeah. what, do you, what do you most appreciate about each other's writing? Because I know you're familiar with it, of course. So what do you appreciate about, it, appreciate about each other's writing? Dad's That's writing. That hard, Rosemary. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think Dad's writing has a lot of depth to it. Um, he, with this book, it's based on a lifetime of lived experience. And it's very true to that experience. He doesn't helicopter into a world he doesn't understand and try to tell a story about it, which has always really bothered me about a lot of popular writing is just that it, it feels fake because the writer hasn't lived it. Uh, his other book, which he hasn't really been highlighting is a historical novel. And I know just from knowing him, how many years of research he put into it, that again, doesn't really, appear on the page but because it, it is also an action novel but it informs the action and i think you could that people from that era would recognize themselves in the book which is a hard trick to pull off so yeah that's uh my answer well thank you <laughs> and what do i like about rosemary is um lots of things um the precision of her language is really very, very good. I mean, when she describes something, she just time after time just nails it. You know, her second book was about, uh, Rough Crossing was about her early experiences as a commercial fisherman. And boy, just her description of 
what happens on deck and what the galley looks like and all it's like holy mackerel because i've lived that life holy mackerel that's interesting but um yeah and so i i appreciate the precision and i appreciate the truth of what she says it's just uh that's the underlying thing that um you were asking about and frank seuss was teaching rosemary about is it the underlying truth of what she's seeing and she does that really really well um, i'm envious thank yeah thank you so right. what's what's one question you would like to ask each other about your writing about their writing i'm curious with dad's book uh with his fishing book because he did work on it for many years and during that span of time he it was probably originally about the same age as the characters he was writing about. He's now older than them. And I'm wondering how his, how not his relationship, but his understanding of them shifted through time um, because they are, as one of the characters describes them, a merry band of losers. Um, they are people who on the outside could seem to be a bit derelict, but you see them from the inside, so it's easy to love them. And I'm wondering if dad, um, if his understanding of them softened at all with time or, yeah. What would you say about that? Well, that's um, a good question. Um, the thing about the, the fishing book is that I, I show characters at various age some quite young the, the college students and inexperienced and all the way up to people the skipper oh, both skippers grew up in the industry and so i'm seeing you know a lot of different viewpoints and, and the fact that i took so long to write the book meant that i lived most of those so but that's actually um more noticeable in in my second book uh, also the novel Stellar's Orchid and, um, and it describes it's got a young man telling the story of an adventure in his youth but he's telling it as an old man looking back at his youth and um, I really didn't think about it it took me so long to get that one published that by the end I was um, I when I first came to Alaska I was about the age of the youngest character uh, the, the main character was a young man 23 but by the time I got it published, I realized, you know, I was about 70. So I was as old as the old man looking back at his youth. And all of a sudden, I said, how'd that happen? You know, so, um, and that, I think the book was the better, that one particularly was the better for that uh, viewpoint. Wow. Um, yeah. And I was kind of borrowing that technique from Joseph Conrad, who uh, wrote a really wonderful long short story called Youth, and it's about an older man describing a younger man watching an older man, and it's just a beautiful, beautiful balance of uh, the different viewpoints and how the older man was not entirely sympathetic to his younger self, you know. Uh, uh huh. So yeah, it was a great piece of writing, and yeah. I with uh yeah. borrowed from it a little <laughs> cool yeah and but one other question for you rosemary um you have mentioned frank seuss and uh, i've always wanted to know now that uh, frank is gone um what lessons you you've already pretty much talked about uh what he's helped you with for technique but what as a true mentor what did he teach you about the writer's life, about how to respect the what you are doing, you know, respect your own writing and respect your characters? And, and what, what a, do you remember any lessons there that, that have stayed with you? That's a really interesting question. Um, I can't really remember a lesson in words, but I remember an, a lesson in example that I watched over many years. And he was a deeply compassionate man. He was extremely kind to all of his students. I wasn't unique in that. For years after 
after I graduated the MFA program, he would still meet to edit my work. Every time I came through Fairbanks, I once had an, a problem with the administration at the university, which he called to fix. And I found out later he'd called from the ICU to help me out. And again, that was not an uncommon story for his students. And I think that the lesson that I took and we all took from that was respect for our work, um, like compassion for each other and a belief that what we were doing and who we were mattered, which is actually really hard to achieve when you're an author because almost everything you do is all alone and self-doubt and anxiety will stay with you both while you're writing and for years afterwards. It's, it's hard to read aloud your work because you see all the flaws, but you can learn to carry inside yourself that belief that reading and writing do matter and that what you have to say is worth saying. Um, so that's what I learned from him. That's a, wow. you know, that's a really nice note to kind of wrap things up on. I love that. That's great. It's a great yeah. comment. Yeah. Beautiful yeah. answer. And, yeah. 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 Well, thank you. Thank you. So mm -hmm. any other comments or things you want to talk about or say about your writing or writing in general or mentoring or the writing life or Boy, elements I would, of your story? I would love to just end on that note from Rosemary. I mean, it was that, great. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Well, okay. it's been wonderful talking with you guys. Yeah. Thank you so much. Both. Really great to Thank talk you. to you. Thank you.